teachers. What's the difference between 1997 and 2017 students? Story 1. Everyone is going tech, so I'll go with cultural. All teens rebel. They all think they have it right and the grown-ups have it wrong, but they show it differently. In 97, the prevailing word was anger. I hate the way things are. Kids were harsher, meaner. Being nasty was the way to show you're cool. I saw a lot of kids get their kicks out of breaking the Santa illusion for grade schoolers, for example. Seventeen kids are much nicer to each other. Think of the music of the time. Smashing pumpkins, nine-inch nails, and the like. In spite all my rage, I'm still just a rat in a cage. In 07, the word was mope. Kids were softening up, being nicer to each other, but also getting more into the sadness is beautiful kind of thing. They weren't angry at the adults so much as they just wanted them to go away and hide into their hoodies. Leave me alone to my solitude. Consider the way emo was huge at this time. At 17, kids are much nicer to each other. They're kind to young kids and friendlier in general. But there's this strange undercurrent of competition to be the most good person, which leads to weird, yes, mayonnaise is a gender if that's how you identify kind of thing. In 17, kids want to explain to the grown-ups how they're all bigots. They also handle failure far worse than previous generations. 17 kids try harder and genuinely want to succeed in ways that the 97 kids didn't. In 97, you were cool if you avoided working hard and didn't care if you failed. But 97 kids also recovered from adversity faster. They didn't bruise as easily. They were harder, meaner kids but also didn't quit as easily and thrived on constructive criticism. Now, there's bits of each of these personality types in every year. There were nice kids who were also soft in 97, and there are mopey emo types now. But the prevailing culture shifted these ways. It's understandable that each generation wants to differentiate themselves from the previous one and express themselves in their own unique way. It's reassuring to hear that at 17, kids are generally kinder to each other and want to succeed, but it's also concerning to hear that they handle failure worse than previous generations. It's important for parents and educators to teach resilience and the value of constructive criticism to help young people navigate challenges and setbacks. Story 2. Graduated high school in 93. Taught middle school. I noticed a definite change regarding phones, social media. Went through the whole adjustment of no one having a phone to trying to enforce rules about phones to just dealing with them. From a teacher's perspective, I'd like to smash the hell out of their phones when they're using them in class. Kids think they're sneaky. Some are really not. Anyway, went from kids being jerks about phones to now being cool and better about being polite about it. Definitely more parental involvement now as opposed to 10 years ago. I feel students today want to be told exactly what to do and won't risk trying to figure it out on their own. My husband just hired two assistants who are 22 and 23 in his job. He says they're constantly needing guidance for stuff they should be able to figure out on their own. It's just interesting that he's seeing it as well, and has nothing to do with education. Students today are more aware of social issues. Most kids in 1997 weren't thinking about equality and immigration or anything political. Now, kids are much more informed and mostly more tolerant. Kids today do not seem to care about being outside as much. Probably because the media overdose has everyone convinced there is a pervert or unaliver behind every bush. I find myself spending ridiculous amounts of time on my phone looking at sites and other digital entertainment. It's strange to realize how it feels like a waste of time. In 1997, this was not a problem. So it's not just changing students. It's a change in all of us. Teaching has become a lot cooler as far as technology goes. Not so much with the administrative interference. It's also encouraging to hear that students today are more aware of social issues and are generally more tolerant. It's true that the media has made people more fearful about being outside, but it's important to encourage kids to enjoy the outdoors and not let their phones consume all their free time. Teaching has evolved quite a bit over the years. It's great to see that you've been able to adapt and continue to make a positive impact on your students. Story 3 Graduated high school in 1995. Taught middle high school in 2007, and I'm teaching college in 2017. I'd argue the biggest difference is technology. In the 90s, pagers were all the rage, and the internet was relatively new to the masses. 
than something you did sitting down at a computer and excruciatingly slow. So as a teenager, we spent a lot of time hanging out with each other one-on-one -on -one with an absence of technology. Sometimes we'd want to play video games, but multiplayer was limited to a local network or split screen. Most commonly, we'd just take turns. But I'd argue technology was not something we spent a lot of time on, but rather dabbled with. 2007 was the beginning of the smartphone revolution. Many, maybe most students at this point had cell phones. Social media, YouTube were coming of age. And that has changed students a lot, in my opinion. I used to get annoyed and borderline angry when I saw a group of people at dinner all on their phones. 2017? Social media is rampant. A lot of studies have correlated increasing usage of social media with social disconnectedness and even depression. It's as if the creation of virtual social circles has actually created less personal social cohesion. So it's important to put your phone down and go just hang out more rather than less. You'll hear back in my day, kids fill in the blank. And it's, for the most part, hogwash. Kids are kids. Teens are teens. Some are put together. Some have huge obstacles to overcome. Progress that has been made. It seems to me that young people are much more tolerant of other people's s-orientation, culture, and religion compared to when I was a kid. I don't know anyone from my 700-plus high school that was out of the closet or identified as anything other than Christian publicly. I never thought I would see gay marriage happen or magic lettuce legalized, for that matter. And now the focus on transgender issues is at society's forefront. These are great steps that cannot be overlooked and discounted. So back in my day, kids played outside and with each other, teaching kids healthy social relationships. But people that weren't the norm were silenced. These rascals today spend too much goddamn time on their phones, but live in a more accepting society. Oh yeah, and have dank memes. Ah, back in the day, pagers were all the rage and the internet was slower than a sloth on vacation. We actually had to sit down at a computer to use it. Crazy, right? But now, it's all about the smartphones and social media. Kids these days are glued to their screens. But you know what? They're also more accepting of differences than we ever were. Progress is progress, and it's important to keep moving forward. Story 4 I see a lot of people in this thread mentioning how high schoolers these days aren't as creative or don't take risks as often or can't figure stuff out on their own. I'm a high school senior, and I can only speak from my perspective. But for me, I'm hesitant to take risks because the consequences are so great. Let's say that I wanted to take a challenging class and try to push myself a little harder. If I fail or get a poor grade, that drags down my GPA and can seriously mess up my options for the future. If college admissions see a 3.0 and a 3.2 from applicants from the same background, they'll probably take the 3.2. So bam, because you took a risk, you can't get into the college you wanted to. Colleges don't see that you challenged yourself and took a risk and learned from your failure. They see the failure itself and dismiss you for it. That mindset, one of, you have to be perfect and don't mess this up or else, is one that I see all over. So much is expected of me that it's hard to take risks and deal with failure. Because not only do you have yourself to beat up over it, but everyone around you also berates you for it. It's hard to take risks when it seems like your entire self-worth and future is at stake. Standard Disclaimer I was not in school before the 2000s. This is my experience as a student and member of the younger generation. Story 5 since I am an old fart who has been teaching during all of these years, I will give my impression. The main difference I see is in attention span and impulsivity. The 2017ers cannot focus on only one thing. If I'm talking, they'll be doing ten other things. They have the attention span of a gnat and can't sit still for love nor money. But if I stop and ask what I just said, they can usually quote me word for word. I've seen an exponential increase in attention deficit and vestibular issues. But the really strange thing is they just don't seem curious. Maybe they're so bombarded with information they don't need to be. Where kids before would ask lots of questions, want to know and find out things, the 2017ers just seem like flatliners who could care less. Content knowledge has been watered down because they can just Google it. But they don't. If I had Google at their age, I would be in heaven. 
2017ers can literally find out anything in the world they want to know at the touch of a few buttons, and they just can't be bothered or can't sit still long enough to do it. There's one elementary teacher's take. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. Story 6. I wasn't old enough to teach yet in 1997. I was four years out of high school, young and naive. In 2007, students were semi-glued to their phones, but the technology to integrate them into the classroom, Twitter accounts, Facebook, Snapchat, etc., wasn't there, nor was it encouraged in any way through administration. There was still a phones-away rule, for the most part. The students in my tech courses at the college I was working at were older, either getting recertified, new degrees, or simply enhancing their current skills with newer ones. I would put most of the ages in the late 20s to mid-30s. In 2017, I have young students right out of high school. It's rare now that I have an older student. Most of these students come in with at least basic knowledge of technology, hardware, software, but more often than not, they are even more advanced than that. It's interesting how the tech group got so much younger and more skilled, while the older group, I don't know, do they not move forward anymore? Are they switching to different careers? Story 7. Not exactly what you're looking for, but I have a story to share. My father graduated high school in the mid-60s. After graduation, he and a few friends rented a sailboat and went from the Carolina coast to the Bahamas. Young, free, healthy men spent a few days sailing, a week on the beach, and sailed home. When I graduated shortly after 9-11, I tried to repeat this trip with a few of my friends. No one would rent their sailboat to a couple 18-year-olds. I guess societal trust has changed. We finally find one through a friend of my father and set sail for the Bahamas. Two days in, and we see a helicopter, then a Coast Guard vessel. Then we're boarded by U.S. government guys with guns who say, All right, boys, what is it today? You move in guns or substances? After searching the boat for hours, and it's a tiny boat, and finding nothing, we were let go, but instructed to turn around and sail home under the threat of arrest if we continued south. Yeah, so I guess things have changed a bit. Looks like someone tried to follow in their dad's adventurous footsteps and got a bit of a rude awakening. I mean, come on, renting a sailboat and sailing off to the Bahamas is a pretty bold move, especially as an 18-year-old. But I gotta hand it to you. You were determined to make it happen. Too bad the rental companies didn't share your enthusiasm. Can't say I blame them, though, with all the craziness in the world these days. Story 8. I was a student in 1997 at the school I now teach at, so I can answer this one. 2017 students are infinitely more polite harder working and more intelligent than my cohorts ever was. They're much less likely to smoke, they don't drink cider on the playing field at lunchtime, and they don't sell each other awful weed in industrial quantities. I gather they sell each other excellent quality weed in very small quantities instead. It's a big secondary school on a fairly deprived estate, so these aren't exactly kids who go to etiquette classes after school but I literally can't open a door by myself because some 16-year-old with mutton chops will spring out to open it for me. If I'd done that when I was at school, it would have been instant social unaliving. Story 9. 97? Little regard to terrorism. 07? Remember 9-11? 17. Can you explain what 9-11 was? I wasn't born yet. As a history teacher, it's been interesting and difficult trying to instill the gravity of events to people who weren't even born at the time. I imagine it was a similarly strange scenario for teachers who taught during the attack on Pearl Harbor or the assassination of JFK. Strange to have major life events turn out to just another historical story for kids within a few short years. At the same time, it gives me motivation to keep teaching with the same passion as if the events just happened, so kids continue to understand its importance. The perspective shared by this history teacher is both insightful and poignant. It is true that as time passes, major historical events can often lose their immediacy and become mere stories or footnotes in history textbooks for younger generations. However, it is important for educators to approach their teaching with a passion that communicates the significance and gravity of these events, even to those who are not alive to witness them firsthand. Story 10. My dad taught middle school from 1968 to 2004. When he retired, 
I asked him what changes he saw in students from the beginning of his teaching career to the end. He answered, The kids never changed. A teenager is always a teenager. The parents, however, changed dramatically. They used to respect teachers and side with us in disciplinary matters. But now they think their kids are perfect and we're wrong. Glad I'm getting out before it gets worse. Story 11. Going to sound like an old man here, but when I was in high school in 97, we had a system where various teacher's aides would photocopy all of the notes, answer keys, homeworks, etc., and put it in an unused locker. My whole class, even the future valedictorian, used that locker. I'd imagine cheating efforts have advanced since then. Story 12. I teach English at a rural high school. The biggest issue for 2017 students is that they have almost zero self-confidence. I don't know if this is a product of culture or if this is just a fluke with my students. However, they're unwilling to try anything challenging or new without an extreme amount of one-on-one -on -one guidance. And that's very difficult to give in a classroom of 30. Story 13. 1997. Colorful hair and piercings. 2007. No colorful hair, lots of tattoos. 2017. Colorful hair and tattoos. I teach in college. Oh, the other difference was, 1997, no one talked about being gay. 2007, students came out to me privately in my office. 2017, students talked about being gay in class. Story 14, 97, quit passing notes. 07, quit texting. 17, are you seriously watching Netflix right now? Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.